And when you're finished, if you would just remain standing with me just for a few moments. Our assistant pastor, Reverend Desmond McKenzie, is coming to break the bread of life to us this morning. And before he comes, we're just going to read five verses of scripture. I'm sure he'll share more with us, but this is just the preview. This is the trailer. So if you will, if you would join with me in reading these five verses, we'll be reading from 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. But know this that in the last days perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away. Hmm. That's the trailer. Brother Desmond is coming. Why don't we put our hands together for him? I've been blessed for almost 32 years to call him my father. And before he speaks to us, I'd just like to add a disclaimer to the reading that I am the sole example who is not disobedient to parents in these perilous times. And I'm sure he'll elaborate on that and convince you before you leave this morning. Let's one more time put our hands together for the Lord for what we're about to receive. God bless you, you may be seated. <laughs> so, let me take care of a couple of housekeeping things. The first one is real housekeeping. Um, you see these black claws here in the front. It, it's not because we keep the devil shoved under there. That's, that's not what that is for, but uh, for the time since we've been in this church, some of you who are aware of sort of the mechanics and so forth of the building understand that we've been fighting a running battle with the sound system since day one with, you know, rats eating cables and various things. And uh, now it's at the point where we pretty much have to take everything out and put everything in. And so there's folks running cables and doing repairs and trying to create a new sound system over the, la over the next uh, few weeks. So th this is why you've got these big holes here as that work is being done. And uh, so soon and very soon, we will have a, a sound system that hopefully will last for a good while. Now, speaking of things that last for a good while, I came in this morning and over here, I, it was time travel. The family of David and Ruth Tallman, who were missionaries in Mexico and before that, I'm trying to remember the name of the country before that. South Africa and you know when when we arrived at the church on Greenwood Avenue there were there of course we were all a little bit younger smaller and um, we all grew up together you know there was your brother Nathan Tallman 
Uh, there's Ken Ryder, who some of you know. There are a bunch of us all strung out across the third or fourth bench. And, um, you know, sitting in church. And there was a, I shouldn't tell you this, but there's a thing you can do if you're sitting with somebody. If you look in front of you, there's a corner of the bench before you, right? And if you put your foot underneath their, their leg, you can just kick up suddenly and smash their shin against... So, yeah, we had times in church being touched by the Spirit. <laughs> you guys didn't, I'm sure. It, it was only our role that, uh, that did that. But to have Mark and Philip and Lucy and Vanessa here today is amazing. It's amazing. God is a lifetime God. I was about to mention years. I won't, I won't. You'd, some of you would go, oh, I read about that in history. But um, let's say Canada's centennial year would have been one of those years. And let's say next year, it's going to be the 150th anniversary of the country. So uh, that gives you a sense. But I think my first introduction to Halloween, you know when it's Halloween, but they bring all the church kids together and have kind of a, well, the first of those was at your house in Aurora, Thornhill, somewhere up there when it was like, you know, the sticks. And uh, then we got introduced to Kitchener through you all. <laughs> And now we got two kids who are exiled in Waterloo. <laughs> so your fault, your parents' fault. Anyway, welcome. This is a, a faithful, faithful family. Been working for the Lord forever. A miracle family. I can't say, more, but I'll, I'll stop. And, and, but it's amazing, amazing to see you guys. Gran would be overjoyed to be here. So we'll, we'll send them a video, you know. And uh, just welcome. And Philip, you're going back to Mexico tomorrow? Um, I don't know. I can carry bags or I can at least push stuff. So if you need help, I could do Mexico. Uh, you know? <laughs> so if you, if you feel led to you know, invite us, um, let the Lord lead you. And now I want us to read again. We read from 2 Timothy chapter 3. And now I'd like to take you on a little trip back into Israel, back into the worship that they had under David. And, uh, and his brother Chris was called Asaph. And our Asaph is called Brother Chris. But Asaph wrote this, it's, it's this Psalm 78, it's called a contemplation of Asaph. Asaph was sitting there thinking, you know, you know what's weird? This, this is what Asaph was doing. I, I know this because the Lord shows me these videos, right, of the Bible. Anybody else have that? You're reading the scripture and the Lord kind of shows it to you as a video. Please, somebody that was a hand I take that as a hand I know you're stroking your baby but anybody else have the Lord talk to them that way talk to you in videos thank you that's two in the mouth of two or three witnesses anybody thank you I, I knew you were a man anointed of God from day one okay there we go we, we even got four witnesses so so here's the video that I see Asaph is sitting there it says a contemplation of Asaph so Asaph is like Hmm. You know what's weird? This is what he's thinking. And then he begins, the Lord begins to speak through him. He says, this is Psalm 78. I'm reading from New King James Version. Give ear, O my people, to my law. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known, and our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from our children, telling to the generation to come 
the praises of the Lord. This is what we saw here this morning, a commitment to commit to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wonderful works that he has done. For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children, that the generation to come might know them, the children who would be born, that they may arise and declare them to their children. Why? That they may set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments and may not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation. Y you notice that? Usually what do we say about kids? Oh, they are the stubborn and rebellious generation. What's the Lord saying about the parents? Or, <clears throat> okay, the fathers. <laughs> that kids don't be like them. They were a stubborn and rebellious generation. A generation that did not set its heart aright. And whose spirit was not faithful. Is that talking about us adults? This was a contemplation of Asaph. Asaph was going, I'm not so worried about the kids. I'm worried about the parents. Because the parents are supposed to commit this stuff to their children. But when I look at the parents, their heart isn't set very much toward God. And their spirit isn't faithful to God. It's an interesting statement. And then he goes on to describe, he says, the children of Ephraim, being armed and carrying bows, turn back in the day of battle. So they're all ready, they're all armed, they've got weapons, but when the battle came on, they just turned back. They did not keep the covenant of God. They for refused to walk in his law and forgot his works and his wonders which he had shown them. And it, 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 it goes on to talk about all the marvelous things that God had done and God had shown them. So, what am I saying? That the problems that God's people faced in the past, they're not just in the past. They were pernicious then, they were persistent then, and they're still present with us in various forms today. And so, uh, as we consider how we should live today, we need to look at what happened there. Here was God's people with all the knowledge of what God had done in the past, armed with bows, ready to fight, but as soon as a battle faced them, they turned. Because somehow they knew that the power wasn't there, we're not keeping the covenant of God, we're not walking in his laws, we've forgotten his works, we might as well get out of here because we're not equipped for this. And what I want to tell us today is that we can be equipped. God has, God has given to us in these perilous times, in, in everything we read about in 2 Timothy, the, the mental and the spiritual atmosphere that prevails. and the condition that Paul said would be in the church. He said, it's not just the perilous times out there. But he said, something will be going on in the church. We will have a form of godliness. So you look at the building, right? There's a form, there's walls, there's, you know, a ceiling, there, there's structures. So we have... But if somebody went out with a big, I don't know, wire cutter, cable thing, and snapped the big the cable of power coming into this building, what would happen? Microphone would stop, lights would go out, air conditioning would stop, everything would just go. Because we would have the form of a church, but then no power. Right? So, 
It's not because God's power is not there or it's not available, but because we deny it, we ignore it, we disregard it in the way we live or the way we make our way through the world. Even in how we worship and live for God, we depend more on this power than we do But since times of old, God has given his people powers. Powers that we can immerse ourselves in. Powers we can call upon. Powers we can use to break and diffuse and destroy the works of evil all around us. He's given us ancient powers. I'm going to list just a few of them, and we're going to have to move quickly. So we'll, we'll do five ancient powers. Show me five. Five ancient powers. And um, so those of you who with a memory, we're going to do the presence, the song, the prayer, the people, and unity, the blessing of unity. So start with number one, the presence. Now this, the presence, very often, if, if you go through the Old Testament sometimes, you'll find it with a capital P, the presence, the Shekinah, the glory. This is what distinguishes God's people from any other people. Uh, scripture for that, Exodus chapter 33. Let's look at 13 to 17. If we can pop that up real quick. Exodus 33. Moses says, Now therefore I pray, if I have found grace in your sight, show me now your way, that I may know, that I may know you, and that I may find grace in your sight. And consider that this nation is your people. Next verse. And he said, What did God say to Moses as his big promise to him? My presence will go with you. You're facing enemies all around. You're facing starvation in the desert. You're facing people that are complaining. Well, God says, here's what I'll do. My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. Let's go. Then he said to him, if your presence does not go with us, don't even bring us up from here. We might as well not move. We might as well just stay right here and, right, if your presence doesn't go with us. For how will it be known that your people and I have found grace in your sight, except you go with us. So shall we be separate, your people and I, from all the people who are upon the face of the earth. So the Lord said to Moses, I will also do this thing that you've spoken, for you found grace in my sight, and I know you by name. What's the one thing that distinguishes you from anybody else on earth? The one thing that distinguishes God's people from any other people? The presence. Without that, like anybody else, the presence. So the first ancient power that God has given to you way back from the garden is his presence. So you look at the, the, the history of Israel, right? This presence has remained with them through victories, through defeats, through dispersion, through discrimination, through destruction, all the way through to the creation of the nation of Israel, right? Reestablishment of the nation, the worship of Jehovah in Jerusalem. And that presence was also with the church in the New Testament. That presence was in the prison with Peter and Paul and Silas. And that presence was with John when he was exiled to a labor camp on the island of Pat Patmos, revealing to him the mysteries of times still yet to come. And that presence is here today. And that presence can be with you every day, every situation of your life. How can that happen? God makes it so simple. He says, call on me. Just call on me. He really is as, oh, now I hear a song. He's as close as the mention of his name. Anybody not know that song? 
Google it. You need to know this. He's as close as the mention of his name. Another one says, whisper Jesus. Now I'm looking for a witness. Anybody been in any situation where that's all you did? You just said Jesus. Why not try it right now? Whatever's going on in your life, whatever you're thinking about right now, just try whispering Jesus. Jesus. He really is as close as a mention of his name. So that is the first of the ancient powers that God has given to his people, his presence. Number two, the song. Now when Israel, God helped Israel to cross the Red Sea on dry ground, they sang, Moses sang, Miriam sang, everybody sang, right? And th this is the response of our hearts when, when, so we started with the presence, when our hearts encounter the presence of God and we see what God is doing, it's almost a natural response, like an eruption. You sing, right? Sing with the spirit and with the understanding. Oh, magnify. Somebody, anybody here ready to break out in song? No? Okay. Well, then let me tell you about this uh, ancient power here. In fact, God said, you'll find this in Job 38, as, as God is describing to Job the creation of the world. And, and God said that when he created the earth, the morning stars sang together. And the angels shouted for joy. Those of you who like astronomy, check it out. The stars, the constellations, are still singing. There is still music being emitted by the heavenly beings, the heavenly bodies in this universe. Check it out. I, I can't go into it right now, but go do your research. You'll find out that the heavens are singing. Anyway, Fast forward to when the night that Jesus is about to be betrayed, he's preparing for this betrayal and beating and death. And, and you know what Jesus did? We, we saw he went to the garden of Gethsemane and he prayed. You know what he did before he ever went to the garden? Anybody? It's in Matthew. It's in Mark. It says, after they had sung, a hymn, then he went out. So here is Jesus preparing for the greatest crisis of his life. And he says, brethren, let's sing. Before they even went out to the Mount of Olives, to the Garden of Gethsemane, for him to pray, for him to be arrested, they sang. Singing is spiritual. Singing is strengthening. Singing is victorious. So as the presence of God in the Ark of the Covenant, as it came into Jerusalem, the people sang. Everybody sang. The king, David, sang and danced before the Lord. And, and when the apostles, we heard this last week, the apostles Paul and Silas, were, they were thrown into a rat-infested dungeon. They were beaten. They're down in there, there's slime, there's insects, and you'd think that what they want to go, oh, ew. but what did, they, what did they do? They sang. And their song shook the earth and rocked the prison and set both them and their jailer free. So, <laughs> down here we sing, when we get to heaven, we're going to sing a new song the song of the redeemed right and you say well i'm not in heaven now but until then my heart will go on singing and until then with joy i'll carry on 
until that day my eyes behold the city until that day God called me home until and all I wanted to do is start it again, just to show you something. When a song gets inside you, 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 you get to the end of it and you go, mm -mm. And, and here comes something, it, until then. And this thing is not fast, it's not your big high energy song, but it just, mm, until that day. When my eyes behold mm, mm. Praise the Lord God uh, I see some old church people, little church people around I don't know if you remember sometimes okay people would be praying there would be all kinds of stuff happening okay after a while people would come from who knows where in the city and show up in this little church that nobody knew where it was and they had all kinds of different problems going on all manner of different manifestations and whatever happening and people would be praying and it just be an intense situation and I remember my dad said one time, okay, he, he got everybody up in like a, okay, everybody out of your seats, out of your seats. And matter of fact, I need some volunteers. Come, 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 quick, 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 quick. About 20 people. Now, 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 now. Yes. And, and so he'd, he'd make a semicircle. Yeah, if you stand over here and just a semicircle around the front, that's it. That's not 20 people. Okay, I'm numerically challenged, but even I know that. Okay, yeah, because I figure we need about 20 people to make a, a semi. Okay. Okay. Are, are we, are we, do we have enough for a... Good, good, good. Come on in. Come on in. Come on in. Okay, that's, that's pretty good. It's not 20, but it's, it's a semicircle. Now, what do you think he would have these people do? No? Sing. He should just, just stand there and sing. So let, let's let's see what what might we sing. Um, I'm trying to think of what a, what a, a song like that he would have sung. Um, it would be like uh, well, one just came to my mind. I don't know if it, I know it was a blood. I know it was a blood. I know it was a blood for me. One day when I was lost, he died upon the cross. I know it. Then it would switch to like three, four. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, we have the victory. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, who? And then you declare it, tell me who can stand before us when we go in Jesus' name, in the name of Jesus. We have the victory. And, and then, I mean, who knows what else? We could go on. But, and the thing is, we did go on. Because by the time you finish that one, then it's like, you know. Mm, and then stop. But there's, there's, there's more ancient, ancient parts to come. But like, fire, fire, fire. Right? <laughs> Mm, as on the day of Pentecost, let fire fall on me and all that. And, and sometimes it was just, it was slower. It was, I 
Okay, but you, you have to stop because if we keep going, okay, and anybody that was inside that semicircle, anybody that was in here, there's not a question, are they going to touch God? There's not a question, are they going to be delivered? There's not a question, are they going to break through? There, no question. There's an ancient power in a song. And, and I, okay, here's a tragedy. We have, I know Ryan's talked about this. We got iPhone, i, I things, i devices filled with all kinds of songs. But it's not all those songs that have the power. There's lo I love music. I like so songs that sound nice. They sound nice and it's, it's good. But there's songs that have the power. Okay, and, and okay, I'm not just saying so fill, your, fill it up with Christian music because there's some Christian songs that sound nice. And you listen to them, they're well done, it's great, and you're, yeah, yeah, that was good. And then you put on another song, and mm, okay. Okay, that one. That one has the power. And you, you, you can tell, you can, you, you can tell right away from letter A. Um, <laughs> that's a different song. But you, you know what I mean, you've, you've, you've experienced it. Right? You can play all kinds of different gospel music or any other kind of, and then you play a song and it's okay. That one was released from heaven. So, thank you. You may be seated. Thank you, semicircle people. Would you believe that is number two? That is ancient power number two. But, hey, I, I'm, I'm going to ride it, if you will, for a minute. Let us sing. Let's sing with the spirit and with the understanding. Let's sing until all oppressing spirits vacate the air around us. Because they can't stand the songs. I'm just saying it in a sentence, but that represents a whole bunch of stuff that I've seen. Sing until angels join in. Sing until sorrow lightens. Sing until our spirits soar into heavenly places and the presence of God fills the place where we are. Oh, we have to move to ancient power number three, the prayer. So we're going to go from the song to the prayer. Now, God makes a statement in Second Chronicles 7.14. It is as simple as it is powerful. He says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, then I will hear from him. I will forgive their sins and I will heal their land. Simple as that. It, it, so you, you, see, you see what he's saying in the middle there. Turn from their... So what kind of people are these who are praying? People who are just coming out of wicked. In fact, they're not even coming out of it yet. They're in it. They're in the middle of it. That's why he says, while you're praying, uh, turn from your wicked way, which means that when you started praying, Sister Velma, you're still in it. And God says, okay, but if you will pray, if you will humble yourself, if you'll just pray, if you'll say, this is only God, only God can do it. And you seek my face. So in other words, it might not be the first minute that you're praying. You might have to seek my face. And in doing that, have you ever had that? You're trying to seek the face of God, but stuff is in the way. If iniquity is in my heart, if I'm regarding iniquity in my heart, the Lord can't hear. And so he brings that to my attention. That's all you who God ministers in videos. Yeah, he shows me the video of different things going on inside me. Or things that I've done or said. Or things that I'm feeling and won't admit. 
and he just plays it like so. And I have to go, oh, okay. <laughs> Any witnesses? Three people, okay, thank you, four. Right, so that's why it's in the middle of the verse, because in the middle of your praying, you have to turn. And once you turn, what's the next word? Then. Then who? Then I! I'm telling you, one of these days I keep threatening, I'm going to, you know, take on an assumed name and go to South Carolina or something. And I'll say, my God says, he says, I! I will hear! Hmm. Anyhow, we are in Toronto. Hmm. He says every one of those sins I'm going to forgive. <laughs> and everything we need fixed. What does he say? I will forgive their sin and we think about our bodies being healed. God says I'm going to go way beyond your body. Everything around you. Everything around you. Now Oh boy, I'd love to linger there. I would so much love to linger there. <sighs> but I hear some people thinking, you don't think I hear you, but I hear you thinking. You're thinking, but I prayed about X, Y, and Z, and, and so all I can say is take it up with the boss. Because in doing so, you will be praying. And you may be surprised at what will happen when you bring it back to him and say, but I prayed. And he will say, but I heard. And the minute you start to seek his face again, you will be surprised. Okay. Now, as individual human beings, we, we don't have the power to construct buildings or to change governments or to heal diseases, but we have the power to pray. If the church can do one thing, it, we can pray. And when we do, God works in a myriad of unforeseen ways his wonders to perform. Right now, I'm waiting for him to do the wonder of shrinking time, but the clock keeps moving, so we're going to keep moving. Ancient power number the people. An ancient power we might not immediately think about is God's people. It is God's people who attract his presence. It is God's people who sing unto the Lord. It is God's people who pray and move heaven and earth. God's people who demonstrate the magnitude of his grace, the fact that we were in our wicked ways, and he did forgive us, and did heal our lives. This is what demonstrates God's grace on earth. It is God's people, you and me, that he said he has engraved in the palms of his hands that he cannot forget us. Quick example. A king of Moab by the name of Balak once hired a prophet by the name of Balaam to put a curse on God's people. I remember when we were on Western Road, there was a Madame somebody that had uh, a psychic shop right across from the church and she seemed to open up for business right when we'd open up for service and a few of the sisters at church were insulted by this they thought mm, mm, we're just gonna pray against her they didn't go they didn't protest they didn't you know put graffiti on her wall they just came to the altar and they prayed to God mm -mm. Well, every time I come to church that woman's opening up her door with her so they prayed and pretty soon Madame tell your future had no future no business she was gone nobody going in there shut down door closed and more people coming into church so I gained a great respect for the sisters the daughters of Zion, they, they, 
They want you in, you're in. They want you out, you're out. So anyway, this king of Moab, he had enough sense to know, yeah, you need a prophet of God if you want something to happen. So he goes to Balaam and he says, put a curse on God's people. Now, we know that there is plenty enough hypocrisy and wrongdoing and everything among God's people to, to merit a curse any day, right? But when Balaam opened his mouth, time after time he tried to pronounce this curse, only thing that would come out is blessing. In fact, <laughs> Numbers 23, you'll see the whole story. In verse 8 he says, how shall I curse whom God has not cursed? Got this? Everything is wrong with the church. This is a fact. Anything that you, anything you might want to think of that could be wrong in a church, it's probably true. <laughs> and so it should have been easy for Balak, B, the other one, Balaam, to just curse it because there was plenty of evil there. But he, he ended up saying, wait a minute, how can I curse who God hasn't cursed? God sees it all. God knows more than you or me or, or, or Balaam did. And yet God's not cursing his people. God's not cursed the church. He says, so how can I curse whom God has not cursed? How shall I denounce whom the Lord has not denounced? God's people are blessed and cannot be cursed. Could you look at somebody and let them know this? You're blessed and cannot be cursed. Put some feeling in it though. So you're blessed and cannot be cursed. Hmm. His people are so important to God that when Moses insulted them and struck the rock and said, drink you rebels, God prevented him from entering the promised land. But with all of their, the people, all of their warts and waywardness and whining, the people entered. Still today, it's through God's people, through what we might see as his bumbling, imperfect church, it's through those people that were baptized and prayed for and healed and taught and tested <laughs> and made ready to serve and ready to meet the Lord. The people of God, the body of Christ, is a power, a great power that God has given to us and placed around us. I can tell you, and I, I, I see the clock, but let me tell you, I know that for a fact. When the people of God decide to pray for something, impossible is meaningless. God just does it. The people of God can pray somebody back to life. That's just a fact. It's not a theory. If it was a theory, I wouldn't be talking to you right now. I'm pausing because I think that these ancient powers, we receive them intellectually and we still don't get it. We, we don't get that this is reality that we are dealing with here. And we look at circumstances and things that happen, we view them as reality and we don't get that God all of this stuff from ancient days, these are the powers he has given to you. Okay, number five. And it's related to number four, but it's an essential ingredient to go with number four because this ancient power, number five, is the blessing of unity. 
What could be, what could be so important that when, when God sees it, he commands a blessing? What could be that important? What could be so important that the blessing he commands is eternal life? What could be so powerful that when God saw it among some people, he said, hmm, as long as that's there, nothing will be withheld to them of anything that they want to do. I've already made it a law in the universe that if the human race, if human people will ever come together in unity, I won't stop anything that they're trying to do. It's so important to me that even though what they're doing is wrong, as long as they maintain that unity, I'm going to let it happen. So the only way I can stop it without breaking my own law of unity, because God is one. So unity is like the basic law of the universe. Think about it. Okay, uh, how do I do this in a family show here? Um, Adam, Eve, in garden, just created. Uh, they don't know anything about male and female. There's no instruction manual given to them. God just puts them there. And he says, now, they're different. Different personalities, different bodies, different everything. But if they ever decide that they kind of like each other to the point where they would like to become one, hmm, they're going to find that A, I made it that way, and B, in that, I've given them the power to create life. They know they're made in my image. They don't know the extent yet to which they're made in my image. But when they decide that they're going to try to become one, they're going to find out that in that unity is the power to create life, which up to then, God alone had. That's how much God values unity. When we're together in unity, uh, this is Psalm 133 that sets it out clearly for us. God compares it to the holy anointing oil. If you could put up Psalm 133 just so people can see. He compares it to the holy anointing oil that was poured on Aaron, the high priest's head. Right now he had this mitre, this hat on his head, and the oil was poured on him, ran down. Interestingly, the only part of Aaron himself that it actually touched was his beard. But, uh, but it was poured on him and just dripped down him from, from the hat to the hem. And everything that was covered underneath that unity was blessed. So, to couples, God says, maintain this unity so that your prayers won't be hindered. To friends, even friends like Job's annoying, accusing friends, God says, still, bear each other's burdens. In fact, God turned around Job's fortunes. Anybody have any idea when God turned around Job's fortunes and blessed him twice as much as he had ever been? Do you know when that happened? Yes, when Job prayed for and offered sacrifice for his friends who had been busy accusing him and saying all kind of stupidness about him. And when Job prayed for his friend, God said, okay, so we saw earlier that when we turn from our wicked ways, God hears from heaven and he says, now when we turn from disunity to unity, and say, although you are absolutely wrong, absolutely full of faults, absolutely annoying, absolutely everything, I'm going to pray for you. And Job at this point had almost nothing left, but he still made sacrifice for his friends. And God turned the whole situation around when he offered sacrifices and prayers on behalf of his friends. When we gather in unity, God didn't say, I will be here. He said, I am there. When we pray in unity, he promises to hear. When we sing in unity, we shake apart the bars that imprison us. 
when we march in unity. Oh, I want to pause to make a commercial for Jesus in the city. Everybody had a lot of comments to make about a certain prime minister and a certain parade. If you stay home for Jesus in the city, because you don't think your presence matters on the street. Okay, okay, that's September, uh, first Saturday in September. Okay. <laughs> when we march in unity, the gates of hell cannot prevail against us. All right, are you ready? Fact. We live in human bodies full of faults and failures. Fact. <laughs> Some of us right now are going through situations that threaten to overwhelm our knowledge, our patience, our strength, and our resources. Bigger fact. <laughs> the bigger fact is from 2 Corinthians 10, 3 to 5, okay? It says, although we walk in the flesh, we don't war in the way of the flesh. The weapons of our warfare, they're not carnal, they're not human, they're not material, they're, they're not explosive, they're not chemical, they're, they are spiritual. They were designed in heaven to work in such a way that his will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. The weapons of our warfare are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds of every sort, even strongholds in our own minds or in other people's minds. They bring into subjection every thought to the obedience of Christ. So, you remember Psalm 78 that we read? The children of Israel, fully armed, but turned back in the day of battle. What I'm saying to us is we're fully armed. We have ancient powers. We don't need to turn back from our battles. We don't need to huddle and cower in fear as the world turns darker. We have ancient powers. Let's use them. <laughs> Sister Elise is coming and I'm trying to tell her telepathically to sing if my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face. And then everybody in the church who wants to explore that ancient power of prayer is gonna come and pray. But in case she doesn't hear it telepathically, could you tell her? If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves shall humble themselves and pray if my people who are called by my name shall Turn from their wicked way. 